Albert Einstein once said that there are two ways to live one's life. The first is as though nothing is a miracle. The second is as though everything is a miracle. Today, I'll be looking at the miraculous from two perspectives. First, I'll be speaking with a scientist who has researched hundreds of miracles for the Vatican. Secondly, I'll be speaking with a community who lives by faith and whose mustard seed has grown into a new church. I'm Jenna Murphy, and you're watching Catholic Focus. Throughout the centuries, miracles have fascinated believers and non-believers alike. For those of us in the Catholic Church of the 21st century, we often forget that our faith was founded on miracles beginning with the ultimate miracle, the Incarnation, God becoming man. Since then, the Church has witnessed many men and women who lived their lives on a supernatural plane. One such man is St. Pio of Pietrelcina. St. Thomas Aquinas, a big doctor of the Church, he used to, to tell and he wrote in the Summa Theologiae, Gratia supponit natura, the grace supposed the nature. In Padre Pio we see a man, a good man, a, um, that comes from a, a good family of southern Italy, um, family as uh, we had in uh, whole Europe, in whole Christianity at the time, full of faith, and uh, this man became a great priest. So this nature was uh, uh, enriched by the Holy Spirit with miracles, with power, with caribs, and he used uh, all these things to help his people, to give praise to the Lord, to be a great priest. Nature and supernature are always mixed in a, a, a man, in a woman, in a baptized, and in Parepio this was really visible. Saint Pio, also known as Padre Pio, was born into a farming family in southern Italy in 1887. Padre Pio's mother said that from childhood the boy reported conversing with Mary, Jesus, and his guardian angel. His childhood was a foreshadowing of the wonders to come. For 50 years of his life, Padre Pio bore the stigmata, the wounds of Christ. He was also known to have the gift of reading souls in the confessional. Testimonies of his contemporaries confirm that he also had the gift of bilocation. He would often be seen celebrating the Mass and visiting the sick at the same time. The majority of the pilgrims I, I saw in these years uh, don't come uh, for miracles. They just come to, I would say, to breath the air of holiness. They sometimes, when you are sick, when you are in, are in troubles, you, you look for uh, the prayer, you look for uh, help, you look for miracle maybe, but uh, the majority just come to find uh, the deep sense of their lives. In Europe, like in Northern America, I think, uh, uh, we sometimes we live in a, a comfortable desert. Uh, we have everything we need to live, but we are in a desert uh, in our soul. And generally they come to find the breath of the Holy Spirit uh, and they are blessed in this uh, uh, search because God always answer, used to answer to everybody that asks for that. At the time of his death in 1968, thousands had heard about this miracle man. Crowds were flocking to his monastery in San Giovanni Rotondo, not necessarily seeking miracles and healing, but desiring only to get a glimpse of the old priest. That miracle is just a sign of the presence of God. So sometimes in his freedom, uh, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, gives us the signs of his presence, of his love, touching sick, uh, uh, healing them sometimes. But miracle is just a sign, like the, the same Gospel of St. John says, uh, sign. He used St. John's Gospel used the word sign for miracles, sign of the presence of God. My grandmother had a ruptured disc in the early 50s. She was told that she most likely would never walk again, that they would do the surgery, but it was doubtful that it would succeed because the disc was already ruptured. So. Um, my mother and my grandmother prayed to Brother Andre and they asked uh, everyone in the family to pray to St. Joseph. So she was healed and she did walk and her promise was if she did she would bring her steel brace to the oratory and she would make a pilgrimage to St. Joseph Oratory 
every single year of her life until her health would no longer allow it. And that is, in fact, what she did. And when we see a sign of this presence, signs that were so, so many in Padre Pio's life, that we are called to give thanks to Jesus Christ, to give thanks to God, to worship Him, to, to be more faithful like He's faithful to us, He's tender, He's gentle with us. the church, the designation miracle is not one without a price. The church, in fact, like St. Paul says, is called to test all things. Uh, the Vatican, when they are researching miracles, calls on teams of experts to exhaust every academic and scientific avenue. We have one such physician here with us today. Dr. Jacqueline Duffin is an author, a professor, and a hematologist at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Dr. Duffin has studied over 1,400 miracle cases in her work. Dr. Duffin, thanks for joining us and welcome to Catholic Focus. Your Catholic claim to fame, so to speak, was your research with Marguerite Duville, St. Marguerite Duville, and uh, your research was actually what eventually led to her canonization. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit as to how that came to be and how you became involved with the miracle business at the Vatican. <laughs> yes. It was in my life as a hematologist that I became involved, and at the time I didn't know what the purpose of my involvement was. I was asked to read a set of bone marrows without being given any information about the patient, and it turned out that it was a case of severe leukemia that had gone into remission, then it relapsed and went into remission again, and I assumed the whole time I was doing the reading that it must be for a lawsuit and that the patient was dead. But it was only later I found out that she was still alive and that her case was being investigated as a possible miracle. So how did you react when you found out that that, that was the actual case? That's why you were doing your research. How did you I, find that? I was completely amazed by this information. I was amazed also that she was still alive because she had had a, an aggressive form of leukemia and she had had a relapse, which is a very bad sign in hematology. Uh, and I might add, she's still alive today. Uh, 30 years basically after her diagnosis. So I continue to be amazed by her case. But I was also astonished uh, to discover that the Vatican was putting such scientific pressure on the putative miracles used in canonization. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know all that much about the process itself. I imagine you learned quite quickly what the process <laughs> was. Was that your very first case that you examined for the Vatican then? Was that the Yes, it was the indeed the very first wow. case. And it is in my collection one of the most recent of the miracles that I have studied. OK, so I'm imagining that professionally it would be very taxing to go through, you know, to basically exhaust every avenue you can think of scientifically to prove that something, you know, isn't inexplicable by science. I'm wondering how, what kept you in this business? You know, it's obviously a, a very difficult task to try. You'd have to be well versed in many different levels. I'm wondering, so what keeps you fascinated by all of this? And what keeps you going? Well, the first experience, as I told you, was in my life as a blood doctor, but my investigation was in my life as a historian. And I was interested in what the other miracles had been in the past, rather than being involved in any more myself into the future. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to know if the Vatican had always placed such high scientific pressure on their investigation of miracles. And okay. uh, although, you, although you allude to the idea that it took a lot of work, it didn't really. Uh, neither for me nor for the Vatican. It took time mm -hmm. and patience. But the stories are so engaging, and the access to the files was quite generous that I was able to gather this information. And the other thing is that the Vatican calls upon experts as they need them, so that they don't have one person who sits and studies them all. So throughout the whole process, how was the Vatican involved? Did you correspond at all? I know, when did you find out, actually? When was it not a blind study for you anymore? Uh, it was not a blind study for me after I handed in my written report, oh, wow. uh, fairly quickly, in fact, because I, I handed it to the person who'd asked me, and I said directly, what is this, a lawsuit or a miracle? And she said, it's a miracle. And I was astonished, and I, I sat down and listened to the story. But I didn't communicate directly with the Vatican, and this is typical of all the investigations, that they are usually conducted locally. So what happened was my report went to Rome, Rome was then interested in reopening the file. Mm -hmm. uh, it was studied by a panel of doctors in Rome. And then, because they were interested in reinvestigating, there was a trial. 
And the trial was held at St. Paul's Seminary in Ottawa, uh, presided over by a bishop and attended to by a number of clerics. And all the people involved, the patient, the treating physician, her family members, uh, her aunt who was a nun who'd urged her to pray, me, we all had to go forward and give our version of the events as we understood them. I was never asked if it was a miracle. I was asked only if I had a scientific explanation for why she was still alive. And how did you testify on that day? What, what did your testimony sound like if we would have been there? Right, if you'd been there, y y you would not have been surprised by the questions they asked. They wanted my name, my education, uh, where I worked, that kind of thing. They also wanted to know, just as you began, how did I get involved in the mm -hmm. first place? I then was a little worried they were going to ask me very complicated scientific questions, so I brought with me a bunch of uh, articles, uh, the most recent articles on survival in this particular diagnosis, in case it got quite technical, which it did. And I was able to refer to the articles, giving them the best statistics available at the time. I'd even highlighted the relevant passages in the articles so that they could find them and I could find them. And uh, all of this was transcribed into a court record and the whole thing was sent off to Rome again and then everybody was kept waiting for a long time. It sounds like quite a process and uh, just recently we went through that again actually as our, our nation welcomed its second saint with, with uh, Saint Andre of Montreal and uh, I recalled hearing that you were offering your expertise or you were offering yourself to the media for questions especially uh, in light of all the work you've done. And I'm wondering, uh, in doing that, that, it was great that you were able to do that, and I'm wondering, in doing that, what were you hoping to communicate to maybe any skeptics or critics of miracles, and what do you say to people who might be skeptical about this whole process? Right. Well, the first part of your question, um, I think it's appropriate for anyone who works in a university to be willing to comment on things mm -hmm. that they know a little bit about. And uh, my university had had uh, been featuring the fact that I'd written a book on the subject and uh, although it wasn't me flogging the media it was the media calling the university that led to my appearances uh, with the media and I think I think it's our responsibility if we if we have these wonderful jobs that we have that if somebody wants to ask us a question we should be willing to answer it as to the um, the commentary from the public it, it's divided in a number of ways uh, some of which feels a bit like an attack Mm -hmm. I've, I've never claimed that I was a, a religious believer. Mm -hmm. I was raised in a Christian tradition. My husband is a Jew. I believe that there are lots of things we can't explain scientifically, and I have no problem whatsoever calling them miracles, but my definition of a miracle does not require it to have been worked by God. Right. On the other hand, my belief that there might be a natural explanation is just that. It's a belief, and mm -hmm. if my patient if my patient believes that God has uh, come to heal them through the intercession of a saint, mm -hmm. I think that she's entitled to that belief too. I, I see them as parallel belief systems, and uh, they enrich our world and our life. I was just about to ask you that very next question. Uh, I've, I've read, obviously, that you, know, you don't necessarily include yourself in any religious denomination, um, but you obviously do. You have come to believe in, in miracles, and you see no contradiction there. Uh, so in, in your most recent studies, I'm just wondering, have you, have you looked any more into you know, faith traditions and what they believe about miracles? Or do you try to stick basically to science? Have, you've probably been reading a little bit about religious traditions hold to be miracles. I'm wondering if you've to, looked into that at all in your study. Yes. To do the study properly, I had to learn a lot about church traditions. And, and I learned a lot more respect for how the church proceeds. It's not interested in lying. It's not interested in wishful thinking or placebo or um, willfulness, it's not interested in being duped. And it understands that in their enthusiasm to see a saint canonized, sometimes people can get carried away with their claims. Uh, it is interested only in hearing from scientists to tell them if there is an explanation or not. And this is where I get into trouble with physicians, because somehow they think that the word miracle belongs only to a religious tradition and uh, so that it's nonsense, that there must be something wrong with the science that was used to endorse it. Right. The church does not see an inconsistency there because the church sees everything as a creation of God. Mm -hmm. So should it draw upon the best of science at any given time to help mm -hmm. it answer a problem, it's completely in keeping with God's work on earth through human beings. And uh, I, so I did learn this uh, additional respect, as well as learning about medicine as a belief system in its own right. 
Well, that's wonderful, Doctor. I wanted to thank you very much for the work that you do. We're deeply grateful for that. And also thank you for joining us on Catholic Focus today. Bye. The miracles that Dr. Duffin examines tend to be spectacular and rare. Some miracles, however, are a bit more difficult to measure. They may include the acceptance of a heavy burden, a sudden change of heart, or maybe the healing of a marriage. All of this after persistence in prayer, maybe even to a particular saint. These miracles do not tend to draw crowds, but for those involved, these miracles are just as life-altering. For one faith community just outside of Toronto, the path to their new church building has been strewn with many small m miracles. The church uh, started as a, uh, an offshoot of St. Margaret Mary Parish. And um, when it came to naming the parish, uh, it's normally the pastor that uh, uh, gives three names to the archbishop. In 2001, uh, my father came down with uh, colon cancer, and he was told he had a year to live. Uh, some friends of ours sent his name to the shrine of Padre Pio in Italy, and um, they sent back a rosary and said they would pray for him. As a result, uh, we found another doctor uh, who operated on him, and uh, he was, became cancer-free. We attributed it to St. Padre Pio. So when the Archbishop asked me to uh, name, uh, give a name for the, the three names for the parish, I said there's only one name, St. Padre Pio, and I told him why. St. Padre Pio Parish had humble beginnings. Before the construction of their multi-million dollar basilica-style church, the faithful gathered each Sunday in a school gymnasium. They did this for eight years. Our community first started with the spirit. When we first started in the actual gym, there was a spirituality that just transcended everything. It's not your typical liturgical church. We praise and we give glory and we uh, lift our hands. It's a very happy church. And that's because a lot of people can relate to St. Padre Pio. St. Padre Pio is a modern day saint. People that we know have actually touched him, talked to him, have prayed with him. He is an intercessor which each and every one of us knows. So it's not like some uh, ancient person that we're reading about in history books. He's one of us in actual facts. There's people that have actually been with him and when they tell us the stories, it's like them talking to us about one of our uh, family. In the same way that Padre Pio is present among his family all over the world, he is now especially close to his family at this newly consecrated church. This, this church, which we are dedicating and consecrating to the Lord, to the glory of God and the service of his people, is indeed a place of beauty. But it is for us, each one of us, in our life of faith and for all who are in our wider community to come and see this, this great church. It is for us the dwelling place of God. We pray a lot. We have a prayer line that anytime anybody is ill, we put them on the prayer line. And after Masses, we will actually pray for anybody that needs prayers, whether it be depression, whether it be matrimonial. We've seen so many miracles, marriages that were falling apart. And through prayer, they're now so much together and they they have grown together. We've seen women who used to come to church by themselves and kept praying that their husbands would come. And now if you see, there's a lot of married couples where husband and wife are fully participating in the church. It's not just the women that come and actually do some of the normal jobs. It's men and women that uh, come and they pray together. They say the rosary together. Whenever there's any sort of turmoil or trouble in the community, we all gather together and we pray for each other. We give each other support and encouragement. That's the spirit of St. Padre Pio. It's like he's there. He's there with us and he encourages us. And we look at it as we want this to be a parish of healing. 
We want it to be a parish that heals us in body and in soul and in mind. And that's what makes us so different. We have over 3,000 registered families just from a school gym. I can't wait to see what it's going to be like now with our new church. Why there is a big turnout here is it's not just our community. St. Padre Pio has a lot of devotees. There's so many St. Padre Pio prayer groups around the world. And we've already had busloads of people coming uh, just in our olden gym. So we're expecting the same sort of thing here. And what you see here tonight is a lot of devotees. People who are devoted to St. Padre Pio and wanted to be part of this amazing event. For the people of St. Padre Pio Church, their patron is not some faraway figure. Instead, he is a close friend who nurtures faith, hope, and love in their community. When we consider the closeness of the saints, miracles then should not really come as a surprise to us. After we've exhausted human reason, we find ourselves to be more than ever as children before a loving God. God's foolishness is, after all, wiser than human reason. And that's today's edition of Catholic Focus. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at focus at saltandlighttv.org. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.